Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out on this uh, Saskatchewan winter evening. My name is Mark Spooner and I'm a member of the Faculty of Education. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the University of Regina and our faculty for sponsoring this event. It's part of our Talking About School and Society where we uh, pick topics to, to discuss and really delve into, and sometimes they're provocative, oftentimes they're provocative. So uh, I'm also thankful, not only am I thankful to the university and to my faculty, but to all of my colleagues who support this kind of work, who support um, not being afraid of discussing issues and delving into what it is we're meant to be as an academy. By way of territorial acknowledgement, we're on Treaty 4 territory, and I'd like to acknowledge that. It's the traditional territory of the Cree, Salto, Nakoda, Nakoda, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis people. Now, I say this acknowledgement not in a token fashion, but to remind us all of past and ongoing colonization, to remind us of treaties, nation to nation agreements that were made and that must be respected and they grant us the privilege to be peacefully gathered at events like this one tonight. And I say it in tribute to the land and this place that sustains us and lends us life. Tonight I have the honor of uh, starting the evening and I'm going to introduce a new U of R, a recent U of R journalism graduate, Brad Belgard, also known as InfoRed. And it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome Brad. I'm, uh, I always think when I look to you, Brad, I think you make the U of R proud, and I'm glad you're one of our graduates. And then when I think of uh, Dr. Len Finley, I think of the people I'd like to emulate, the people that uh, I think embody what the Academy is about in that quest uh, for truth, the quest uh, for justice, and uh, never letting go of the aspirational ideals of higher education. So it's a real honor to share a bit of the stage with both of you. For those of you who aren't uh, too familiar with Brad, although I think probably most of you are, he's a CBC uh, Future 40 Award winner, a Nietzsche Gear role model. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Belgard, also known as InfoRed, has been a featured artist at events such as uh, Aboriginal Music Week in Winnipeg the APTN's Aboriginal Day Live, and Vancouver's Olympic Games celebrations. Brad is a proud Nakota Cree member of the Little Black Bear First Nations who calls Regina home, a true believer that education is the new Buffalo. His works in schools gave him a unique opportunity to present his educational methods at the 8th International Conference of Intercultural Education in Indigenous Context in Tomoko, Chile. 2012, some of you may be surprised that InfoRed performed for His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall during their royal visit here in Saskatchewan. So I welcome Brad to the, or InfoRed to the stage. That, uh, that opportunity to perform for Prince Charles was kind of like the, the colonizer makes the colonized. <laughs> It was a really unique opportunity. It was the most awkward rap show I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, but this evening's not about me. I'm glad you guys bared the weather and came here to um, witness something that I consider is a very, very important topic when it comes to education and academic freedom. Um, this evening's guest speaker is a distinguished university professor, Emeritus. He was the director of Humanities Research Unit and founding member of the Indigenous Humanities Group at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, he's also been the past president of Academy One for Arts and Humanities at the Royal Society of Canada. He's trained in 19th century European elite and radical cultural theory of production. His Canadianist work engaged with the indigenous settler interface. Historically and currently, the distinctiveness and endangerment of the humanities in Canada and the connection between academic freedom and Canadian politics. He served for almost a decade on the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, including two terms as chair. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Len Finley. Well, thank you everyone for 
uh, coming here in this uh, not quite spring uh, evening. Uh, uh, January in Regina is my sort of gig. Uh, uh, my own kind of political severities can be echoed in the rigors of the climate in ways that give me even more entitlement to get important things off my chest. I, uh, uh, I'm grateful for the uh, invitation. Uh, I uh, am humbled to be on uh, Treaty 4 territory in the traditional uh, homelands of the Métis. Uh, it's great to be back at the University of Regina. Last time I was here, it was toasty. I was in the beer tent with, with Mark during the, uh, the Congress. Uh, the University of Regina brought its A game to that particular event. It was spectacular, it was so well done. It performed the, the multiple connectivities between the faculty uh, on uh, this campus and the disciplinary and interdisciplinary and non-disciplinary communities across Canada. Uh, I may have the arguable misfortune of being associated with the University of Saskatchewan. <laughs> well, I have a great deal of sympathy and solidarity uh, with this institution. Uh, I've come here tonight to talk about uh, the notion of uh, get this and talk about, uh, I like non-controversial titles, and here's a clear example uh, of this, of overreaching and <coughs> undermining. Uh, the idea that overreach is, it, it, it has damaging negative uh, consequences, and that a particular kind of uh, overreach uh, in the academy, which is marked by the rise of academic managerialism, uh, is something that needs to be named, uh, something that needs to be resisted, something that needs to be replaced by a reanimated Canadian collegiality that returns the university in essential respects to its most reliable custodians. So what I'm looking at tonight is a shift from shared governance <laughs> to academic uh, managerialism. Uh, and I put the, the challenge rather starkly in the opposition between serving the university as a curious collegium and serving the university within an obedience machine. Uh, it's a deliberately stark opposition, uh, but by curious I mean two things. I mean curious in the sense of peculiar. I also mean curious in the sense of endlessly inquiring about the nature of knowledge, registering what we don't know, and considering how we can uh, remedy the deficits in that knowledge. And then the question of obedience, I mean, obedience? Is obedience training anywhere evident in the academy? Well, I would say it is everywhere, and it needs to get uh, to be uh, removed. And at the center of this is the idea that uh, is it for people, young scholars, particularly new scholars entering the academy, uh, is this the signal that they get of towing the line, keeping the nose clean, uh, being on site with the dominant rhetoric that emerges from the top of the university, and that that's your only avenue to from the academic precariat into the tenure stream. In other words, I see the university as an anomalous entity. Uh, within current regimes of uh, ownership, management and work. But its anomalous and curious structure, its peculiarity is part of its essential value. Its peculiarity then remains inseparable from the curiosity and indeterminacy, as opposed to, say, the, the targets for strategic planning, uh, which often resembles Polish uh, prophecies of annual shoe production in the 1950s from a command economy. Looking for the places where we don't know, valuing the things that we would like to find out about, but we don't yet know how to lay down. And in, in the middle of all of this, it's a very dangerous time for this province. It's a, 
I, I think that uh, the current moment is full of peril as well as full of obligation. We live in a province we, and we inhabit and represent uh, leading universities, uh, institutions, invaluable to this, this province at a time when the province is humble and strong and cold and bushy raw. There are major cleavages in this, in this place. People are divided against the, each other with an intensity more emotional than irrational. The Trump disease has elite north of the border. Uh, where are our universities in this? Our leadership in the universities should not, in my view, be intent on putting the faculty in their place, but putting the faculty out there to represent, to communicate, to educate, to make this province the place that it should be, in tune with its better selves, and able to perform productively real differences in a way that makes us a more just society. So, my overview is, uh, what I want to do tonight is take a, a, a broad uh, look at uh, post-war trends in academic governance in Canada and the shift from that collegial governance towards managerialism. I'll have a look at the overlapping non-identity of institutional autonomy and academic freedom and find that space, that non-identity puts forward as an opportunity and poses as a danger. I want to look at the question of, of self-governance. Who governs the allegedly self-governing? Comments I would like to introduce there on the University of Calgary, plus two uh, historical and still very current examples from the University of Manitoba and the University of Saskatchewan, pointing towards the U of R. I'm going to leave that for the, the discussion period, I think. Uh, I look at the, the hazards and the illusions of planning in the managed university, where shared services models then to ingest shared governance uh, to, in the interest of a more efficient, responsive, uh, uberized academy of independent contractors, a dystopian vision, I hope you agree, uh, an uberized academy of independent contractors uh, connected to things like Suzanne Fortier, president of McGill University, one of Canada's leading universities, the best one uh, as she sees herself, talking uh, a couple of years ago uh, about Davos, which is going on at the moment, uh, in the Globe and Mail, and saying in the report on business, it's an application for a statement by her in the report on business, as technology rapidly changes, universities must respond with great haste. There is presidential capitulation of a high order that needs to be called out as precisely that. So one could reply with Marlowe's Faust's Olenti, Olenti, Curiti, Nocti, Sequi. Oh, gallop slowly, horses of the night. Slow things down. Get us off the gerbilized treadmill and back to the notion of a slow food, intellectual food movement. And I will end by arguing that there's a, a better model than the techno-triumphalist one that many uh, academic leaders in Canada offer. They're a better model, <coughs> which I would say is derived from the epochal UN UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and the TRC calls to action, which the belated acceptance of that UN declaration has enabled and that the new and symptomatic CAUT government hit, hits helps. So I will have solutions. I will urge certain master texts of the moment that help us out of the idiocy of the hour as I see it, and that's where I'll be going. So what are the broad trends in academic governance into the 60s in Canada? The major shift is from presidential autocracy, something you might still be familiar with, uh, presidential autocracy to Duff Berber, the major commission report in 1966, a joint report by CAUT and uh, the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. And now, as it were, the leadership and the membership 
collaborating on a re uh, envisaging, reimagining of the post secondary Canadian academic project. Uh, affirming, and what did they find? They affirm shared governance, academic control of the academic agenda within the frame of <coughs> relative institutional autonomy in the service of robust academic freedom. The key piece of the academic project is academic freedom and the institutional autonomy is enabling conditions for the exercise of that freedom. So it is all in service of the faculty's distinguishing property, which is academic freedom as entitlement and obligation. It's a, 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 and a lesson to be easily lost here is the differences of analysis, of interpretation, and interests are not irritations in the academy to be avoided or assuaged at all costs. Difference constitutes the field of shared governance. So only, the only surprise occurs when difference seems absent or fully and finally resolved, perhaps most implausibly, along the axis of capital labor or in the ceremonies of managed or bad faith consensus. So, we're supposed to differ. We, but when we bring, what we bring as value to the table is our difference. We don't elide it, we don't ventriloquize it, we don't wrap it up. We articulate it as forthrightly and constructively as we can. And this shift and lesson are intimately connected to the broader context in which diversity is either uh, viewed either as enrichment appropriate to the field or as contamination and or inefficiency. Difference and faculty differences as a problem to be solved rather than a diversity to be celebrated and to be built upon. So my point is basically there is no license to overreach and hence undermine core values and, and, and uh, 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 core roles in the academy. But what happened, what we got after 1966 was first of all the rise of academic managerialism. And I'll document that a, a little more in a minute. Bureaucratic blow, the consultancy paradox. Universities grew their bureaucracy and also grew their dependency on outside expertise. You would think if you're growing your bureaucracy, what you're growing is your capacity internal to the institution to recognize its problems and address them productively. But the, the, the growth of both bureaucracy and dependency on, on external uh, consultants is to offload responsibility for the policies that are being pursued. And so outsourcing expertise and responsibility at great cost and to little and that was damaging thing. And the rise of Big Brander, and Big Brander is watching you. Uh, Big Brander is scripting you and hoping to manage you uh, in my alarmist language. All of this in an effort to define unilaterally and unidirectionally govern and claim to speak for the university. Who is the university? Who speaks most credibly for the university is a very urgent question of our times. And what happens with this shift? First, the decline of the faculty share and shared governance of an increasingly co-opted collegium. That's a third point. Second consequence, as we'll see, the turn to unionization as the best hope for academic control of the academic agenda and traditional meaning, mission. That is to say, unionization of the faculty is about responsible academic stewardship rather than simply feathering your nest, advancing and improving the material conditions under which you undertake your work. And under this emerges three uh, pretexts for growth in academic management, what I call bureaucratic bloat. And the arguments are from size, <coughs> Uh, complexity and accountability. The first argument is institutional size. <coughs> Universities are so much bigger than they were, 
So we need a commensurate uh, increase in the people who help to manage them. Institutional complexity. That is, more and more entities internally subdivide, divorce each other, or arrive at campuses for the first time, but funding sources diversify across private alternatives to a volatile, uncertain provincial and tri council scene. And then there's the onus of the audit culture. The onus of the uh, 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 audit culture accountability for public funding, an onus whose effects are mostly punitive and whose meaning is compliance. That is to say, the endless uh, demands to justify yourself, account for yourself, that uh, emerge from, uh, from uh, central administration, keeping people permanently off balance, permanently on that gerbil treadmill I mentioned earlier. I'm old enough to remember key performance indicators. I was senior policy analyst in universities uh, during the NDP years uh, in Regina. And it was all about key performance indicators. Universities in Western Canada, including this province, produced masses of data that remained undisturbed, even by a mouse, after they were accumulated. That is, they weren't a database on which new policies could be uh, uh, fashioned and implemented. The, uh, the meaning was compliance. We are asking you, your departmental budget may be seriously affected unless you play ball, unless you generate the data. In that particular process, most uh, damagingly evident to me recently, in the transform us pr uh, process at the University of S Saskatchewan, that led to the great meltdown. That that particular process was all about people terrified of endangering their units if they didn't go along with providing the data. But the template had been uh, cooked up somewhere else in the, in the empty cranium of Robert Dickinson, actually, uh, and we were supposed to live with that in the name of excellence. So each of these pretexts has been used to excuse the shifting of resources disproportionately. And this is an important feature of my central claim. We're all administrators in one sense or another. Administration is not inherently bad. What I'm arguing for is the indefensible redistribution of scarce resources from the core activities of the institution into a bureaucracy which is more uh, vampiric uh, than visionary, and vampiric of uh, the, the academic body. Institutional size, for example, the first criteria, should be a shared determination, responsibly arrived at, rather than opportunistically, opportunistically inflated and globally harvested in the aftermath of all growth internationalism. That is to say, uh, the, the, the internationalization dimensions of contemporary universities in this province and across Canada, uh, they are addicted to the differential, the differential fees that come in to a particular revenue stream, and the notion that that revenue stream is entirely neutral in terms of what the, all those students coming from those places are all eager to study 18th century European philosophy and to be far better watercolorists than they have been hitherto. <laughs> the dependency on a particular uh, revenue stream is deeply directive of the priorities that the recipient institution then has. These are difficult questions, but what we have, we have to think about. And who asks you about, is growing the university a good thing? No. Uh, there we have one view, uh, <laughs> with which I'll have some sympathy. I'm tired of growth. Uh, there are limits to growth. We'll get to that soon. Uh, complexity. Oh, it's so complex. We need all these people. But if you've grown your internal cohort that's supposed to be managing the university, then you shouldn't have to go outside to expertise. Uh, So-called experts outside the university the, those deeply uh, nuanced thinkers about academic work like KPMG uh, and yeah, other ones yeah. who, uh, who, who universities go to. It, it's really quite bad. Complexity, and it is complex, 
that's our bread and butter. We do complexity. That's what defines us. We embrace complexity. We explore complexity. So the complexity is, is something that should uh, uh, animate the collegium in collective deliberations of, of policy and priorities. And, 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 and in the middle of all of this, the key other point is that we're instead, instead of simply blaming one part of the university, above all, we have to believe in the case for public planning and make it your job, everyone's job, to make the public case compellingly on every possible occasion. If we could restore public funding to an adequate level, and that was the job all the way through the university, that was the message that we were conveying, it seems to me we could wean ourselves from a variety of forms of bad dependency, of uh, grants or uh, sponsorship, coming with ties and conditions uh, that uh, constrain indefensibly the role of free inquiry within the institution. We are not a mendicant culture. We shouldn't be one. We shouldn't die like one. And in the middle of this, in the rise of managerialism, how did it come about? Well, here's one example. A key text in the rise of academic managerialism, George Keller, 1983, academic strategy. Remember when the word strategy took over from value and when education was going out the discursive door and planning was coming in the other one? Academic strategy, the management revolution, oh police, in American higher education. A key authority and Saturn was superior to Dickinson's program prioritization, uh, as all, uh, Tony Salmon and I have talked about uh, the great meltdown of the University of Saskatchewan in an article, a chapter called The Salmon and Peerless You, a Canadian makeover uh, comes to grief. And at the center right, you'll see how awful the Dickinson uh, uh, process was. Keller confirmed and helped accelerate the displacement of allegedly outmoded, guild-intensive reason and imagination, understood and esteemed as a multidisciplinary array, grounded in, but not confined to tradition, to, by tradition, displaced by what in copycat acts of unwarranted triumphalism was declared to be scientific management. For me, an unconscionable oxymoron. Scientific management has been the case, and here's uh, McKinnon in the first of his two recent books, University Leadership and Public Policy in the 21st Century, A President's Perspective, a piece of deeply revisionist history, if you ask me, uh, but I won't dwell on that. And McKinnon says, decisions to spend money or invite the board to spend money will not be made by the president's executive at Monday morning meetings. They will be made within the discipline of the integrated planning process. The implications of this emergent, this discipleship, and this emergent managerialism, first creating discursive space for institutional branding and the excellence disease, uh, institutional branding and redirecting resources for the university itself and for its logo corps. There are Canadian universities where you have to use a particular font whenever you speak about the university. The micromanagement of the semiotic process of institutional representation is looked at by people and if you use the university logo on a poster, as I have done, and turn the poster upside, and uh, turn the logo upside down, the simple uh, rotation of that symbol was responded to as though it was an act of high treason. There is se semiotic sensitivity and ownership of the brand, policing of the brand through the logo cops that check that anything that comes out to the university conforms with these te templates. And this isn't just aesthetic fetishism of some sort. This is the expression of micromanagerial control. 
And what's happening on the terms of logo is happening in terms of the faculty and student voice as well. It's also commodifying academic values while demonizing staff. It's about shrinking the mandate and project of the institution, as does McKinnon. Here's McKinnon in his more recent book, University Commons Divided, Exploring Debate and Dissent on Campus. And I don't use McKinnon in an ad hominem way. He is a symptom of a much larger phenomenon. He was chair of AUCC, of, uh, uh, Association of Universities and Colleges of, of Canada. Uh, after he cast his chips in at the US, he then went on to uh, uh, Athabasca University and, uh, and was there as a, a strong-armed uh, interim uh, president who said the University of Athabasca uh, should understand itself as a call center. It was technical, uh, uh, it was distance education, as it was then called. It should see itself as a call center and its faculty uh, who should think of themselves uh, uh, similarly. But here is the core claim about the university that divides the academic community in Canada. This is what he claims. Universities, and notice the extraordinary confidence in the authorial voice. Universities do not exist to pursue social justice or comfort. Interesting putting those two things together. And they must not have their purpose and activities bent by those who are interested in crusades than in the hard work of intellectual life. <laughs> this is one of the most influential presidential voices in this country. In the explicit disavowal of social justice, that radical uncoupling of education and post-secondary education and scholarship from the broader questions of the public interest and the public good. It's funny you use the word crusade. Indeed. And, uh, and, and also that word activities bent. Yeah. Our Emmanuel Kant and Isaiah Berlin would say, that we work with the crooked timber of humanity. Yeah. There is no straight, there is no geometrical line. Yeah. We, are, we are working through our imperfections in, in particular kinds of ways. But this idea of, of bending as a distortion, as a disfigurement, as a pollution yeah. uh, of something that even John Henry Newman wouldn't recognize because of its radical detachment for the things that matter to us as individuals and as a society. Days after I completed the previous slide, I learned yesterday, and you should follow up on this story too, of Dalhousie students protesting the appointment of McKinnon, who is now, uh, as the uh, itinerant gunslinger, uh, he's now at, uh, uh, interim president at uh, Dalhousie University, uh, where his protege, uh, who should have succeeded him, if you read his book on the rights of, of presidents to name their successor, an extraordinary piece of uh, nepotistic musing, if you ask me. <laughs> and in the situation, they replace the trilogy. And the student intervention, if you look at what happened in Dow, is astonishing. Uh, he was up at the, at, at, at the welcoming ceremony. Suddenly, students silently came out from all over the audience carrying uh, uh, placards and quotations from his most recent book and, and suggesting that his idea that uh, white students uh, appearing in blackface was an entirely kind of uh, uh, anodyne activity. That is, the students came out, showed their courage, they'd read his work, they wanted him to be accountable for, for what he'd said. They gave him a peer review of a particularly sick surgeon kind. And such leadership should inspire also uh, us to do likewise in a free and fearless way. That's a, a quotation from the Supreme Court of Canada and a particular judgment uh, on mandatory retirement. But the, 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 court, the Supreme Court felt that what distinguished academics, what was invaluable to uh, their activities, was the pursuit of knowledge as they understood it in a free and fearless way. So that any attempt to demonize or circumscribe that freedom 
any attempt to uh, inculcate servitude rather than fearlessness runs counter to a basic legal understanding at the highest level of why we get the privileges we do in order to meet the responsibilities that we understand we have to. Here's a disciple, you can be a disciple of a different sort. Here's a Globe and Mail, Richard Bruno uh, from Simon Fraser, just before um, Kennan's book appeared, channeled Nancy Fraser on progressive neoliberalism to good effect. Notice that the, the, the myth of the radical Canadian university is the, the title of this. That is, we are being demonized for being too radical, even while we are absolutely the opposite of this. And Bruno makes a very good point. Here, even, even seemingly so-called progressive forces are constrained and molded by the pressures and limits of capitalist enterprise. No fear is this more evident than in the university's treatment of its workers. Universities continue to search for efficiencies and new forms of labor discipline. As a workplace, the university reveals itself to be liberal only in the classic free market sense of the word. In his account, the so-called discipline of scientific academic management produces disciplined labor. So watching how the word discipline moves around that discourse is a very, very telling thing. And it's a disciplined labor which favors neoliberal entrepreneurs of the self, as Foucault would say, possessive individualism, as, as Robert Carson would say, while exploiting a reserved army of underemployed intellectual workers perceived and treated as abundant, precarious, and scared. And so we have the broad trend in academic governance and the legitimation. On their way to the ultimate algorithm, academic managers are now want to discipline, to combine disciplining labor in collective bargaining with disciplining the curious discipline, <coughs> in the sense I meant earlier, intellectual forum. For Thus is set in motion over management and mismanagement of resources in the currently hegemonic value chain based on spurious scarcity. So you get the combination austerity that creates the conditions of defensiveness and uh, necessity, leadership, a treacherous signifier, if ever there was one, in academic discourse, and competitiveness. Collaboration, cooperation, no. The mantra is, it's a jungle out there. The rankers are all around us. Where will we be on the league tables next year? these distorting drivers of uh, academic life. So the one is a, a, a necessity, uh, a leadership is a blind to the, uh, a given and necessity, and a blind to the possibilities of that and abundance economy. But a crucial point, back to the trends, the, 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 the walk, washing out of collegiality, the intrusion of the managerial, and the resistant formation of academic unionism. The more administration wins in scientifically managing the composition and decisions of tenants, the more administration loses its academic stewardship, legitimacy, and credibility migrate from ostensibly open and deliberative collegial bodies to collective bargaining processes and collective agreement language. And this is marked in two huge reports by CAUT in 2004 and 2008. That is, you win, but you lose your claim to legitimacy by managing the academic agenda and co-opting collegial processes. So the more you manage them, the more that the real capacity for significant stewardship moves into uh, union situations. In face of this migration, the academic, in terms of overreaching, the academic Icarus uh, overreaches. Corporate trends, you'll remember that Icarus, his father Daedalus, told him, made these wings for him, but told him not to fly too near to the sun. Uh, he did, the wings melted, and he, he entered uh, the ocean. And, and, and the, the myth of Icarus uh, is central to European Renaissance figuring of hubris. 
the idea of overweening pride, of overreaching, that leads to catastrophe, hubris, ate, nemesis, divine retribution. And in the middle of this, so corporate trends, what happens in the middle of this? The overreach. Follow the money, corporate trends and academic executive compensation, split and sunder the collegium in an avaricious travesty of the old agonistic academy where ideas struggle for peer acceptance rather than the ambitions as struggling for position, power, <coughs> and large salary. And what happens? Resentment replaces trust, and with it the productively fraught academic interactions of faculty, student representatives, and administrators in a largely elected collegial body. We become the, the wind beneath their waves, the, the winds, while workers, the daily advice is, is ignored. My job is not to make my president look good. My job is to do my job, to follow my trajectory, to be attentive to my students. Uh, it is not realizing uh, some vision cannot concocted elsewhere and out of sync with the key values at the heart of the university. With so, tenure, of course. Pardon? With tenure, of course. We'll get to that. Uh, corporate attitudes towards organized le labor refigure unionizing and unionized academic staff as the problem. And here's a quotation from Keller talking about unionized faculty. This is the, the academic managerial guru. He says that unionized faculty are heading the way of blacksmiths, cowboys, and bookstore proprietors. Isn't that a revealing list of people? Uh, now that full autonomy, if it ever existed, is dead, the ivory tower, trouble can go into, uh, the ivory tower is an image of the university as detached, as detached as, as uh, Peter McKinnon would want it and others would want it to be, but it's an, an image of the academy that arises precisely as European universities are central to the imperial project of the acquisition of colonies all over the world. So the image of institutional in, uh, innocence emerges at the time of institutional deepest complicity in the colonial project. But it's there that, and notice the words of your, you know, how quaint yes, yes. of your is now becoming a regulated public utility. So for, for <coughs> managers, longevity, the fact that universities have existed for so long, like Greek mythology, are just so yesterday. What you need is opportunistic presentism. What you don't want is a sense of history. And so what we arrive at as a result of this multiple forms of migration is what I call post-gentility a new academic sociability. Institutional teachers increasingly prefer the company of their team and their fellow CEOs in the private sector to sharing governance and beer with their academic staff. The latest managerial doctrine, total quality man management, uh, uh, transparent, activity-based budgetary systems, tabs, so it's activity-based, so my associate dean comes to my department and says, this new budgetary distribution of resources will be activity based. I put up my hand, I say, could you give me an example of inactivity? Would me sitting in my office reading a book count as inactivity? What, what counts as activity? But of course, the notion of activity is connected to a coercive productionist model uh, which does basic violence to the nature of human curiosity, the fact that some ideas take longer to gestate and share than others, the diversity of the, of, of the academy. So all of this is swallowed annually by presidents at Montebello, or Lake Louise, or Royal Point, or Victoria, while Calvo, uh, one of the favorite uh, uh, organizations of your provost, and because he publishes in that, their, their, their publications, reinforce, Calvo reinforces its sense that faculty are the problem. 
They need to knuckle under and get real. So for management, collegiality comes to mean congeniality plus compliance. Let's all get along and you should remain on your knees. This is the image that's being promoted here. Shunning, cold shoulder, an admonition on your ear, outrageous bargaining proposals, and you know all about them. Or again, outrageous bargaining proposals, coded amusement, disappointment and disavowal, a free to experiment experiences for the inconvenient academic, with a nod to Tom King's inconvenient. Inconvenient, why can't you just be a good member of that? Yeah. And no doubt many in this audience have their own experience to share about allegedly straying off message, of failing to act as a team player, and the managerial malediction of coolness that too often ensues. But after the, in the post-gentility era, insularity and unilateralism at the top breed resistance from below. The gentility deficit is disputed and dismissed by many faculty as one of many inappropriate measures and metrics favored by zombie pl and zombie planning by and for the administrative undead. <laughs> now you may think my remarks virgin on kindness. I would just extol their accuracy. I have seen people who have screwed up universities magically appear in another institution in an even higher job for an even greater salary the next year. The rewarding of incompetence uh, uh, in managerialism is really quite, quite astonishing. So the administrative undead to whom the goal, apart from job security, is not academic improvement, but a depoliticizing academic obedience. Keeping academic staff constantly off balance, scrambling to land the latest metric, the latest administrative system, a strategic plan, lest they endanger themselves and the department of unit. In turn, faculty alienation and despair become more marked among teacher scholars, termed by one leading consultant, tired and entitled. I think it was Alex Usher. I haven't been able to, to uh, confirm that. But one of, of those expert, experts who explained to our senior administration how bad the faculty really are and they really are the problems. Tired and entitled. Tired I can get. The overextension of academic workers is beyond dispute. Uh, people you know, driving down the 401, three different jobs in Ontario University and things. The idea is it's never enough. You get a grant, good, where's your next application? You've done this, this kind of endless uh, uh, drumbeat of expectation <coughs> that supposes we are tired and entitled. But fact is also we reanimate collective agreements. <coughs> and so the collective agreement is an essential text, but we, academic unionism doesn't stay within the four corners of the collective agreement. It is connected to aspirations. And those aspirations are intimately aligned with social justice, the very thing that some senior leaders would uh, uh, disavow uh, a priori. So the 2008 CUT Task Force of Governance, very important document, full of, 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 of good advice. The shifts from collegium to union and to collective agreement language rather than institutional policy as key to academic integrity. The university's uh, administration speak and, 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 and vision uh, and policy uh, cannot be trusted. They cannot be uh, trusted. Uh, you have to work from what you fought for and what is uh, uh, inscribed in the collective agreements. Uh, but those agreements are about responsible stewardship as well as about uh, protecting the material uh, conditions uh, of the employment. And the sharing of best practices, which is astonishing across Canada now, among academic uh, locals, uh, leads to better bargaining, increases in certification of academic staff associations, so the largest con uh, concentration of unionized labor in Canada uh, is now in universities, and we are the envy of uh, other jurisdictions across the world for that. 
And so what we have is a sharing economy, but sharing economy as a political practice rather than a techno-hyped consumer behavior. And behind all of this, we have the double-edged gift of the Harper Decade, which uh, intensified solidarity, uh, uh, increased the sense of menace and endangerment. We got people uh, 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 pulling together. In the middle of this, Anna Centenary, AUCC, in the form of uh, Peter McKinnon and Stephen Toot, who's now in Cambridge, uh, they redid the uh, a EUCC statement on academic freedom. And there's a wonderful exchange between uh, two, uh, Paul Davidson and Jim Turk and, uh, and Peters from uh, the uh, CAUT. You, it, you read these and it empowers you. It, it gives you a sense uh, that uh, things are going in the wrong direction. And that words like notions of academic performance uh, are being used uh, in a kind of plantation overseer way to berate the faculty. Very interesting when, uh, when the AUCC, now Universities Canada, redid uh, its statement on academic freedom and constrained it so that the only speech that faculty are entitled to is disciplinary speech from within their discipline, uh, criticizing the administration entering into <coughs> controversial public uh, areas, such as Humboldt, Strong, Colton, Bushy, Wrong, uh, doing their job in that broader sense, uh, in a civic sense, uh, all of that is constrained. Uh, and the person who refused to sign on to the new revised one was David Naylor of the University of Toronto. Not a bad university, last time I thought about it. And what it does is suggest that the association of uh, resistance to the dominant, the managerial dominant, the resistance comes from dead wood, from mediocre people, but people just can't cut the mustard. Well, David Naylor and the University of Toronto are pretty damn good by any understanding, and they saw the inappropriate uh, reductions of notions of academic freedom, uh, which uh, other uh, universities, including mine and yours, uh, were part into. So what you have here is a sense, uh, and of course David Miller uh, came to a CAUT council. Many, many a university leader would never cross that threshold, wouldn't have the guts or the gumption to do so. David Miller uh, came commended CEAUT for its vigorous campaigns during the Harper decade, during the silence of the Shams, when university president said, we can't call out the government on this. Well, if they can't, who can? And of course he came and he's still advocating for the importance of Canada funding basic research. Uh, rather than the flavor of the day. And so the managed university during the Harper year, they accelerated these tendencies. So emboldened by federal autocracy and its impatient, truculent instrumentalism and silencing, taking particular cues from local uh, uh, politics and business and from leadership gurus and HR hawks, senior administrators ratified and implemented the shift from the liberal arts to the neoliberal arts. So from fractious U to fract U, from steam to stair, taking the arts out of, out of steam. With little consideration, of course, for union U or treaty U or unceded U. Meanwhile, the economy, uh, in its ominous neoliberal singularity, the economy imprinted itself more fully and monoculturally on the university, with the eager connivance of both academic managers who purport to represent, speak for, and defend universities in their constitutive, sui-generous independence and diversity. Just as in Britain, during a similar kind of lockdown, British vice chancellors were some of them the most eager advocates for the bringing of the faculty to heal. Rather than being the advocates for that collectivity, they were one of its uh, 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 most serious 
uh, antagonists. And in the, in the middle of it, institutional autonomy appealed to all the time by our leaders, academic freedom also uh, appealed to. The one isn't the same as the other. And the non-identity is a contested space. But it's a space that is closed in particular kinds of ways from time to time. Their overlapping non-identity keeps open always an institutional space for collegial governance, either as deliberative peer-driven autonomy or as an outlier <coughs> mask for corporate and heteronomy and its state process. So we have a clear, we have a clear uh, uh, choice here. Which will it be CAUT or uh, University of Canada U15? Academic freedom serving the curious collegium or the institutional brand based in capture, disfigurement, and encryption of core academic values and practices. And where does that leave collegial governance now and the backstop uh, of the collective agreement? In a conjunctural space between enforced fetishizability on the one hand and on the other, voracious capital inducing uh, post second uh, education sectoral conflict as of the recent labor dispute in the Ontario college system, and of course Doug Ford's new found law of campus free speech. According to Don Sinclair, often we have to be reminded of who we should really be by people outside the, uh, the uh, immediate purview of the university. Here is Don Sinclair uh, during the, the college strike in, in uh, uh, Ontario. It is not appropriate for one group to have power and control over the core business of your institution. Here, here, I say. Even universities are being asked to be more responsive. And they can't. They have to work through their senates. We can't afford to be that slow. He believes that we have to work through our senates. But people who lead our institutions often don't believe that at all. We have to work through their sentence, not our sentence. Uh, and notice the emphasis on speed, uh, adaptability, and so on. So much for the embrace of class capital, casualized labor, unshared governance, market nimbleness, by academic leaders in other parts of the system. So here you have all, uh, in all of this. But Sinclair still believes working through their sentence. Tell that to unilateralist for. And by the way, who could possibly, deliberately choose Doug Ford as his best buddy? <laughs> I can't imagine. And in the middle of this, whenever the word austerity is used, your interrogation engine has to come in. Oh. Let's see the books, open <laughs> things up, let's have access. Austerity is uh, the robo medicine because it comes back again and again of academic unconscious and, the, and false consciousness. Austerity is reason to other and neoliberalism's articles. Instead of internalizing austerity in bad faith, we need to map campuses as aspirational havens and the deceptive domain of contradiction where signage boasts of sovereignty while its communities are increasingly conscripted or prescribed and external relations of timorous or set to the university is internally autocratic and externally abject. And that is a most embarrassing and damaging contradiction. So how about our history of treasure? I'm just going to wrap another problem. Just look at one example from the University of Manitoba uh, in 1947. Wonderful cartoon. You have a moment to look at it from the Manitoba Commonwealth. 7th June uh, 1947. Uh, you can see that, that figure of enormous sensitivity uh, up there uh, with his top hat and his cigar, uh, winning the uh, Canadian universities. This is the obedience machine I was talking about earlier. The machine is there. Uh, this is an arm's length, this is hands on, uh, turning the crown. Uh, not a woman in sight coming off the assembly line, not a single indigenous person at all, but just the, the reproduction of safe toys. 
He wanted to hold the line there in 1947 that these issues and dangers would back along the way. So owning the means of academic production in 1947. A top-handed tycoon acts like the anti-intellectual precursor of today's directive donors and their academic clumps. The strong arming rather than arm lines in incarnation of money interests spurns disinterested inquiry for the ultra-instrumental assembly line production of safe toys, and those toys where not that uniforms of war veterans demanding a less safe education for a more just, a more just city street, but instead the ceremonial garb of standardized white male tools of capital while dollar bills transform into academic script diplomas with every threat of the university's obedience machine. The moment of this cartoon, and this is the argument for historical contextualization rather than opportunistic presentism, the moment of this cartoon is one of re-emergent post-war socialism looking for a more democratic and open academy for the return of men, as they were called, with the Harry Crow case on the corner, and a more inclusive understanding of public systems and the public interest of what soon, alas, becomes Cold War Canada. The identified cartoonist, in fact, Winnipeg North End's Harry Gutkin, about whom I can say a great deal, yeah. fears reinscription of big business agendas and academic terrorism after a global crisis, as well as implying the reimagining of the public university and its products to replace the dominant economic order and its sedative civics. But this less critique of an academy capital to capital and thus to management science and its servant state is as relevant today as it was in 1947, given the agility, self belief, and crisis management capacities uh, of management of academic markets by neoliberals. And here I would simply reference the invaluable but insufficiently accessed open for business uh, on what terms. A CAUT uh, study of 12 institutions and the kinds of memoranda of agreement they enter into with corporate uh, sponsors and donors. And of course, uh, the university has transparency in its mission statement and is deeply defensive uh, on all these matters about what it's uh, uh, entering uh, uh, into. Uh, example from my own institution, we have, of course, a uh, Confucius Institute on our campus. Uh, our president, Peter McKinnon at the time, signed the first mem uh, uh, memorandum of, of agreement with Han Ban. Uh, it was a secret agreement. It had a non-disclosure clause within it, and the president of a Canadian university signed that uh, a non-disclosure clause. I tried to find out about the text of that agreement. I only worked on the faculty for 40 years. Uh, what's my interest in this? Suddenly one day in my mailbox, uh, an unmarked envelope is in there. I open the envelope, and there it is. The non-disclosure clause is absolutely central to the, the establishment of the Confucius Institute. I go to council, faculty council, I say, well, the institute looks to me like a really strange mix of folk fest and espionage. Uh, there is some discomfort in high, in high circles, uh, and then they re renegotiate and make it, but the fact is that secrecy is a customary mode. It takes faculty, and it takes faculty with little time and meager resources and great uh, uh, resolve to open things up, to find out what is being agreed to and where resources are going and what the conditions are. I'm going to move uh, over to the next bit. So the history of, of academic freedom is a history of academic, a site of struggle far older and larger than the recent CAUT, AUCC SPAC. It goes back through the Enlightenment and Foucault has written on Parisi and the speaking of truth to power uh, from ancient world onwards. 
We need to write institutional histories. We need to know our own institutional histories. We need to consult the institutional histories of other, like Peter Kent's one of, 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 of UNB, in order to use those histories to make our leaders far more attentive to the complexity and dignity of the enterprise uh, of the university as such. So that longevity checks futurist managerial pupils. And we need to appeal, how, how do we pass this appeal? I think we need to appeal to institutions in the key of justice, that justice that many want the, the university to disavow. Harry Gutkin's cartoon did so by exposing the possible farms of institutional autonomy and by urging universities to work for social and economic justice. The TRC calls to action are uh, the master text of the moment, underpinned by UNDRIP, by UNESCO and ILO covenants, and judicial trends in Canada. And here is the instrument for reaffirmation, for transformation that gets us beyond unexamined Eurocentrism and also beyond unbound academic managerialism into a place of productive interaction and dialogue. And the, the TRC calls to action do is the interpolate us, not as subjects of capital, the, the interpolate us in a good way. They emanate from evidence, they emanate also from the critical internationalism of domestically inherited older uh, figures. Two of Canada's greatest contributions to international understanding at the UN are the UN Declaration uh, of U uh, Universal Human Rights and the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. John Humphrey, the McGill lawyer, who was co-author of the UN Declaration in, 18, in 1947, is regarded as a symbol of, of Can Canada's responsible internationalism multi and multilateralism. He's seen as creating the conditions for Lester Pearson's Nobel Peace Prize. He is a star in our national understanding. There are other stars. The other stars who worked at the UN for the creation of UNRWA. They are unheralded in our national imaginary because they are on the Colton Bushy side of the particular uh, uh, bifurcated understanding that this, this, this country has of itself. But here we have a real, a real chance. There's a calling uh, for critical internationalism, for resources, research and rethinking, but it is a call for action without prescription in, in large measure. It allows for a two-row arrangement of separate and parallel uh, interventions as well as modes of post-colonial and decolonizing connection and convergence understood in practice as anti-colonial. Human aspiration then in the Anthropocene, not grand branding hype in the desperate presence. So what are the distinctive roles for us in our, in our university? The provincial government's role is not to be the fist behind the fig leaf of necessary austerity. The Board of Governors' role is not that of secretive, coercive fiduciaries intent on corporatizing mission creep within the deep university, not in the sense of the depth and profundity of its scholarly activities, but the depth of its complicit intrigue with outsiders, the deep university, as in Dick Cheney's version of the deep state. Senior management's role is not survival at all costs, in the precarious profession of the university president. One of the most nauseating discursive displacements at the moment is uh, people saying how precarious our heroic leaders are in their positions of eminence from universities. So the word precarious has migrated way, way up there to those places where deep thoughts are, 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 are lost and courageous actions ensue. When precarity is the national disgrace of the academic labor market. Precariously, precariousness is here, it's not there, but suddenly it's all about them again, and how hard their job is, and how we should just trust them. So what we need for faculty is not co-optation or else in the, in the, in the obedience machine. So we have to build on that part of 
Duff Berwick, 1966. The role of the university administration is to enhance and protect the academic mission of the university. Is this a statement of your? Is this this to yesterday? And in the same paragraph, the word management is there with administration. But that ma word man uh, management. Management should proceed. How? By establishing democratic procedures in the Senate to create consensus. If you want legitimacy in the academy, that's the way you accomplish it. Otherwise, it's top down and it's resistant. So you need job reclassification at the top, despite the damaging dependency of headhunters and secret processes. One of the disfigurements of decisions in the appointment of leaders is the way in which presidential searches at university are undertaken by headhunters. It's a disgrace. It's part of the, of the uh, 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 outsourcing disease. It allows cop-outs. It allows uh, the headhunters to you know, move their product to its best before date is coming alarmingly close, moving people along and subordinating, as happened, it's, a, it's crazy uh, subordinating academic decisions and recommendations within universities to HR approval. Why is that about? That is the, subject, that is the, the displacement of academic knowledge, academic values, academic judgment by someone who's just recruited, in the case of the University of Saskatchewan, uh, from Walmart. So really, you have to, and the leaders are academic advocates and enablers, not uh, CEOs. And I recommend uh, uh, Mark's uh, piece in uh, University Affairs in January 2018 on Ontario's uh, latest lunacy, the strategic uh, mandate agreement initiative. So academic staff, irrespective of status, need to use their intellectual capacities and academic freedom to shape the academic mission of the institution in both collegial and collective bargaining contexts, attuned to and adding to the history of interactions of campus unions and the collegium in relation to the regions of shape. The best way to expose, denounce and displace the new usury and austerity, which claim to be both inevitable and broadly beneficial so that all boats and canoes will eventually rise to the top. Students should be supported, but students should not be uh, divided by, from the faculty. Uh, I noticed in the latest missive that came to you from uh, the, 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 the provost's office that, that, that students are invoked as though teachers don't care about students. The people who really care about them are, are, are academic managers. Well, that is just so much baloney. Uh, and the idea that students need to get value for money, one of the, the awful things at the moment is that students are being constructed not as citizens in formation, but as consumers in full bloom. And what that leads to is the notion of consumer sovereignty invested in students being opposed to pedagogic authority is there than the teacher. And what that sets up is a very difficult, difficult opposition between us. So when we are saying what we want to do, when we are reaffirming our mandate, what we need to do at the same time is locate the professorial voice within the student body. In events in the UK regarding the appointment of Toby Young, uh, to the Theresa May government's board of the Office of Students. Absolutely Orwellian thought police uh, construction, especially revealing. And a source for a proposed fear. You know, and, and uh, are we going the way of snitch cultures on campus? You know, four or five uh, uh, of your, of your uh, colleagues think that you're speaking disrespectfully about the institution and you can get canned for that? What genius dreamed up that of? Where did that come from? What predisposition was being uh, in, in, indulged there? And the idea of, oh, maybe 20 students write letters and, 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 and the professor should be, should be canned for this. In my work with CAUT in academic freedom and tenure, 
uh, in the BC college system, we discovered that students were being brought up from the states into uh, the, the BC college system. And they were being primed to go into particular classes uh, where a text like Angels Over America uh, with a particular view of human sexuality. And they were going in there in little platoons, getting the first assignment, refusing to, uh, to, to write it because it uh, uh, challenged the religious uh, 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 faith, in particular, as God's away, and then putting those, uh, either getting alternative assignments, so weakening the control of the instructor over the curriculum, and then seeing all the nervous Nellies in the central administration who wouldn't back up their faculty, but would instead uh, uh, suggest make an accommodation with that particular kind of student. The idea that uh, we should l we listen to students, but just as we listen to each other, we have to listen critically. And we can't relinquish or the authority we have earned with such difficulty in order to placate the customer. And that is the, and that the appeal to students as customers is deeply, deeply uh, disrespectful to them. And it also is a further commodification of education and a further uh, retreat of the understanding and proper value of uh, uh, academic work. So I, I would argue for the return of the, 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 collegium, of the curious collegium, that the, our students are not there simply learning to labor or to languish passively between precarious engagements and unpaid internships. Students should leave university with a double capacity, a, a capacity for economic agency within the contemporary economy, but also with a capacity for engaged critical citizenship. If you reduce it to the economic dimension of it, it's an instrumentalization, it is a radical reduction of the nature of the, pr of, of, of the process and the nature of its human outcomes. So the question, the groves of academia or the groves of academia? Ecologies of knowledge and territory or the path dependencies of market logic and administrations succumbing to the allure of the opportunity? Treaty or unceded academia and all our relations, or the university means business and public relations. I hope you think the choice is clear. In some, university governance in 21st century Canada must not be global, corporate, and ultra managerial, but actively decolonizing and committed to giving students the tools of critical citizenship to use as they choose for their own benefit and the public good. Not then in the words of the uh, 27th November uh, Global Mail editorial, University, heal thyself, you know. And who do they mean by that? They mean us, they don't mean, they don't mean our leaders. But rather, surgate, rise up. And Dimiebu brought the university's motto as up for another struggle in the 1812, but no less momentous in face of current attempts to annex and remain academic independence, courage, and critique to more completely serve an econometric monoculture dressed up as a prosperity and free freedom. Uh, academic plan is either an emergent agenda in the service of the creative of the previous collegium, or it will prove a managerial masquerade in thrall to a triple reduction. The reduction of citizens to taxpayers the reduction of students to consumers, and the reduction of academic staff to immiserated opponents of, or pet beneficiaries from, the commodification of knowledge. Thank you for your attention. We have some time for some questions. I invite you to use the microphones. Thank you for that provocative presentation. I've uh, enjoyed these in the past. As I look around the Canadian landscape, 
I look beyond the Canadian landscape into places that would be very nice and really fuck things up. There are places that have never really gone that extra mile. When you look at colleagues in the United Kingdom who have given up, and you look at the transformational exercise in Australia, I hope we have the wisdom to understand that the system here has some robustness left in it. But the issue is, it's not growing. It's not becoming more robust. And we're in a position right now where I see new faculty come in here, and they are on that treadmill, and they run yeah. really fast. And I don't think that they, people come in catch their breath for 10 years. How can we, how can we provide that pause to, to move people into a more, what I consider a more mature approach? Well, I think we have to uh, retain uh, or reclaim, whatever the case may be, control of collegial processes and the determination of the, the value and the, per the appropriate performance of our colleagues. That is, we cannot give up. We cannot uh, allow for the introduction of, of, of tenure right. We must resist in every way possible, as my lapel pad says, the ongoing casualization of, of academic labor in this country. And the reason we have, the, 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 the key danger, apart from the absolute economic injustice of extorting so much fine work for so little compensation from so many highly educated people. The, the, other, the other cost of this is that those who are in precarious positions are far less willing and able to exercise their academic freedom, to assert their authority in the classroom, to enter the academic agora and to raise their voice in independent or critical or, in, uh, or inconvenient ways. That is, we, 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 have to, the, we have to argue, it goes back, we have to make the argument for the public reinvestment in the publicly funded institution. Because that, that investment comes with understanding, but it doesn't come with the constraints that particular forms of uh, 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 donor dependency bring with them, the donors acting like, like owners. What we have to say is there has to be a massive reinvestment. Canada is an enormously wealthy country, but it's not a particularly generous country in all sorts of ways. Ask the First Nations and Métis and Inuit of this country. It is selectively generous. It is not particularly generous to its, its, its young people. We should be able to have, you know, the big debate in Norway at the moment is we might have to charge for tuition. Uh, you know, that's, that's and, and the way they have refused uh, refashioning Norwegian universities as corporate institutions, that the business template uh, invades the last redoubt of multiple uh, notions of the, of the economy, uh, valuing indeterminacy as well as planned and predictable outcomes, uh, something that is not only a productionist model. We have to, and the full professors have to be at the head of the queue. We can't be standing behind those students like Andre Dalhousie and the students taking the list from the, from the positions of maximum vulnerability. Those who can remember what the, in, in the university in Canada used to be like have to activate that memory and try and make it come back with a difference. What the key thing, one of the reasons the robustness of our system is still admired across the world is because of CEUT. It's because of organized academic labor across this country holding the line against a new generation of corporate academic managerialism that put the university at unnecessary and very real peril. So I think we've got to speak up. We've got to break these kinds of silences, even though uh, uh, the, the uh, collegial folk are now overpopulated with administrators. 
rather than uh, ordinary members uh, of faculty. Uh, and no, you go up to speak to a room like that, and they've got their clack over here, and you're feeling ever so lonely, and you're hoping that there will be more than one academic spine in the room and you might get some backup from your colleagues and then you, you speak out and then suddenly uh, you feel ever so alone. We have to manage to have individual but also group and collective articulations of the nonsense of the moment, of the uh, catastrophic reduction of human reason, human imagination, human creativity to what is loosely called market logic. What we have got to do is to refuse that e economic reductionism. What we have to do is accept a version of value which goes beyond the, the, the sordid calculation of the gap of costs and benefits. We have to get beyond that and we have got to stand with the students, refuse to be divided from them, and find a collective voice that uh, the public, uh, the, 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 the politicians will recognize. My three years as senior policy analyst in the university's division in Regina in the 1990s. Every time I was asked for a report, I would insert that uh, free tuition would be the Medicare of, uh, of our time. That the, 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 the social intelligence of this province could move from the realm of health to the realm of education. And every time I put in my little aria to a utopian post-secondary future, I was told uh, by my colleagues in, in the bureaucracy, well, Treasury will never go for that. And I would say, to use your language, fuck Treasury. Uh, that we, 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 we can't abandon the project at the first rebuff, at the first obstruction. What we have to do is convince people and ourselves and our colleagues that the cause is just, the evidence is there, the interpretation can be persuasive, and we can change what is happening. Now, I totally agree with you, Dennis, that uh, de uh, the, the slow deterioration of the system, the move to casualization, with the disempowerment of academic workers that that entails, sets up a serious challenge. But we have to make our, our unions, we have to bring out our incredible, we have lots of allies uh, uh, among uh, academic leadership across Canada. We need to nurture those, we don't need to demonize everybody, as I was prone a little to do today. Uh, we are uh, painting with a broad brush. But we have to establish the conditions of effective resistance. And I think that, the, that not only students, but the parents of students who come to our institution, they expect us to be independent. They expect us to embrace the nettle. They expect us to be contrarians as well as conformists. They expect us to have opinions and to have reasons to back up those, the, 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 those opinions. They expect us to quarrel, but it's the productive performance of difference. It isn't the, the iteration of endless and unproductive acrimony. It is the conversation, historically, to which we belong as members of faculty and students in university. And we have to reanimate that reality in different languages, in different communicative platforms, but we cannot allow, we cannot give it up to those who purport to speak for the university and speak for the university in ways that, for example, disavow absolutely its relationship to the public good and the public interest as they are available in the notion of social justice. Here, here. Oh, my good. I'm sorry, I was a bit struck. Your rhetoric is moving. Thank you. It's moving me in. <laughs> well, that's, that's the fear I have, is that it's moving us in this small room. Uh, public space is, is everywhere but nowhere. Um, there's no privacy anymore. I don't see the public and private distinction. Uh, neoliberalism has done a number on us when it comes to universities. 
Uh, we talk about utilitarianism or pragmatism as an infection, but it's really the basis of our culture. And until we've addressed anything outside of university, like go team go and all our individuality and liberalism, we were eating our own, where it's a cannibalization of culture. And I see this going on formidable, like quite like postmodern, you can do what you want, but it's it's disgusting to to its degree because you're just destroying the very foundations of university in a locality. So to offer a fig leaf, please, I would like to extend something of an economic means of such social concern and um, even promiscuity in a sense because this is so disgusting in a large sense because intelligence or commodification of knowledge is everywhere. There's no place in a university I can tap on my computer. Like let's go back to the uh, de-knowledgeizing, uh, de-schooling society. An old friend of mine years ago wrote about it. We are at those terms today. Why should I spend $180,000 for, for a degree in something I can get in three weeks? Question. For, for $4,000, you know? Like, you're running amongst a platform of, albeit I believe in you and what you're saying, but these times are, like, it's just, Mark knows me, I mean, from online, uh, Johnson. <laughs> we're, we're, it's a different era. We're in the era of rage, not knowledge. Like, we're getting our butts kicked here. And unionization or Marx, uh, neo Kantism, if you want to call it that, isn't going to post postmodernism to any degree that people are going to Keith, speak to. Keith, do you have a question? Well, the reason, more or less, is. This is all fine and dandy, but it ain't going to get the job done, is it? Uh, Thanks. I know what the answer to that. Uh, well, I it's just the question I'm looking for. I want a better question than an answer. Um, well, I, I would suggest that the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, is a particular. Uh, that is, you don't. You hold on to the audacity of hope. Uh, you do not relinquish really hope. Uh, you look to the particular histories of the academy. You look to uh, crucial texts like uh, Julia Bondas, uh, Les Trahisons de Clair. I mean, these questions have been around a long time. The, the fortunes of universities have fluctuated radically in different uh, contexts all over, the, over the centuries. What I think that we should have, uh, be attending to just now is to the 1930s, what happened to Italian and Spanish German universities in the in the in in, in, in the thirties. Uh, uh, I ten years ago, the word fascism. If you use the word fascism, it was seen as a as, as a sign that you'd lost the argument. That if you if if, if you appeal to fascism, because fascism was a, a closed chapter. What we're seeing in research and forms of angry populism, which I think there's a lot of rage out there. Populism is democracy. Yeah, but, but there is reason to. And we have to stand with reason. We've watched the, the, the sordid declension of from truth to truthiness to alternative facts to fake news uh, to Trumpian uh, uh, evacuation a, of, of... It's a relativity uh, that's been promoted by universities for 30 years. But, but universities have never been more believed and also never been more needed. <coughs> we need to consider the historical, the ironies and challenges of that situation. That is, the, the, the notion of elite is a simply a pejorative term. There is good elitism and there is bad elitism. If students shine the notion, no, not every, uh, not every uh, high flyer is a Nicholas figure uh, or an overreacher. We are absolutely concerned with astonishing accomplishment. We shouldn't disavow our interests. We shouldn't leave the word uh, elite to be uh, defined by those who are the apostles of irrationality, of the appeals to anger, of the activation of re uh, resentment, and the sowing of the politics of division. We cannot allow, stand by and allow that to happen. We have uh, various happening. forms of credibility. It's happening. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, 
I, I'm, I've also had uh, the whole anti-young people, no, no, young people, students don't have any idealism like they had in our days. So no, I'm interested. They're, they're, they're on their computers all the time. No. Absolute baloney. Students have as much desire to fashion a better world today as they have had in the distant years when I was an undergraduate. All of the, the, chem, the human chemistry is still there. The chemistry of possibility, the chemistry of resistance, the chemistry and the physics and the sociology and the economics of social transformation and the achievement of a more just society. Those are not dreaming in technicolor, those that are not necessarily tilting at windmills, those are places for the accumulation and the mobilization of knowledge and results. I have one last question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have just a question. I don't think there's a quick answer to this one. But um, in the history of reconciliation and indigenization, I've seen across the country a lot of institutions that are formulating their own indigenization teams. Now, uh, when it comes to indigenizing in an institution, I know firsthand it starts in the classroom with the, the soon-to-be graduates will be taking on the world, you know, with their with their knowledge. And so, how do you challenge that from a as a as an academic scholar or as a student or as a graduate or an undergrad student? It doesn't matter. How does one challenge that from an executive an executive? I guess the hierarchy that we, that we have here, because from an indigenous standpoint, um, the smartest people I know have spent 25 to 26 years learning without getting a degree, just experiential. Now, how, how can that be challenged in a productive way, not in a confrontational way, in the, in the way, in the means of being able to cut that hierarchy and just have a level playing field by making an indigenization, a move towards indigenization. I, I use a, my institution, the First Nations University of Canada, as a great example of implementing um, indigeneity, indigeneity and indigenous philosophies and ideologies within there, within everything they do. But in a bigger institution like the U of R, the U of S, or, or U of T, um, they have their indigenous areas, but they don't have the actual indigenization going through. So how can it be, in a, in a challenging but productive way, how can you implement that indigenization process um, from, from the top down without having any type of controversy? It is, this is a, I mean, this is a, this is a, a question of the hour. Your university, my university, have aligned themselves explicitly with indigenization as a, as a, as a, as a project. Uh, in 2000, in 2000, I published probably the most influential thing I've ever written. And it was a piece called Almost Indigenized. The Radical Humanities in the Post-Colonial Colonial Canadian University. And I urged indigenization with, while refusing to define it myself by respecting the idea of nothing about us without us. That is to say there has to be real consultation, collaboration and convergence across the, the curriculum. And, and you, you do what you can. I am marinated in the Euro imperial uh, education tradition. I had to learn, relearn my history of Canada when I came here in order to open myself to these possibilities. And simple things, for example, like asking myself, if I want to be a classicist, I really need to be able to read classical Greek and Latin. If I am a German uh, historian, I really need to speak German in order to understand the finer convolutions of Bismarck's mind. Uh, if I'm teaching indigenous studies, I don't need to have the access to those cultures that is available through indigenous languages. So, the part, so there are selective notions of, in, of expertise, what you need to know to teach a particular subject that reinscribe colonial hierarchies, stratifications, expectations, and the right of me to speak for you and to tell you what you're thinking, what your past was, and what your future might likely, likely be. These, and, and, and that's only one part of this. 
the, uh, the invocation of academic freedom in uh, rooms full of academics, a scientist will stand up and say, well, does that apply to me? Is, uh, I mean, I'm a scientist. Does that apply to me? So there's an unexamined Eurocentric universal that there is only one scientific uh, uh, method, uh, that there's only one version. So what you have to do is, I talked about economic monocultures, but the, 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 the academy is full of multiple forms of monoculturalism. We have to open these up. We have to interrogate their authority, not refuse that authority, but find ways of inflecting and redirecting it in ways that are really open. So, indigenizing the, the university, there are all sorts of holdouts. There are all sorts of eruptions of neo-colonial uh, uh, resentment. Uh, that why do I have to learn? No, so that the, the, the mathematician will say, well, uh, uh, I'm a mathematician. And the question then is, uh, where are you standing? You're standing on the earth not as a generic planetary space. You're standing in territory with particular histories and with First Nations, the first peoples of this place, who have a previous title to this land. So that if you efface the land and the living subjects who walk the earth in a particular time, in a particular place, if you disembody the intellect and take it out of time and out of place, into space, what you're doing is re-inscribing the idea of the unconditional intellect, what the German Mannheim called the Freischwebende Intellectuelle, the free-floating intellectual, who is in a, per per a permanent edifying orbit above the lives of ordinary mortals. Well, we've got to get all, all, our, all our colleagues <coughs> mired back in the mess of our colonial history, in the need to clean up that mess. And that's not going to happen overnight. There will be allies, there will be obstructionists, there will be skeptics, there will be enemies, there will be those who say that indigenization is the enemy of excellence, and you have to say, well, what, ex what do you mean by excellence? I was at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, the BAM Center for the Arts in, uh, a meeting of indigenous scholars and scientists uh, uh, from across North America and Europe, born by MIT. Uh, and uh, they talked about the scientific method, and this elder uh, said, well, you know, what, what are you interested in? And the guy said, well, I do frogs. Uh, he was a very distinguished uh, biologist. And he said, oh, I do frogs as well. He said, uh, uh, how do you understand, the, 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 the guy from Paris said, well, well how do you understand uh, frogs? And he said, well, I try to get to know one. I establish a relationship through habitual uh, observation, which has its own rigor, its own kinds of outcomes that are often aligned with sustainability rather than predation and irresponsible extraction. So there are all sorts of, I mean, this is an edifice made over time the university in the interest. It was a deeply compliant instrument in the imperial project of territorial acquisition across the world, of colonialism. Decolonizing oneself is difficult enough. Decolonizing a complicated institution is full of unevenness, false starts, good intentions, faltering resolve and so on. But it, it, it has to continue. It has to be uh, an open-ended, ongoing struggle in the interests of transforming our institutions so that everybody can see themselves in it. They may not, may not like what there is being reflected there. If you don't, work to change it. Change <laughs> that. Insist on changing it. But we have to work for that because universities use notions of inclusivity while practicing shameless exclusivity. So they've got to be embarrassed about that little contradiction between free, uh, mission statement and practice. They've got to use the notion of indigenization is not add indigeneity and stir, but this is a messy, political, protracted process that should involve us all, skeptics, resistors, allies alike. It's messy, 
but it's an awful lot more promising than the imperturbable Eurocentrism and uh, the yearning for the safe and sta uh, stable days of empire than uh, what we have now. The university has to change, but it has to change into a business as lean and mean as the next one. Its, its destination cannot be mainstream white settler capitalist corporatism. It has to be a very different version of this country. Because we failed miserably. We just had our 150th celebration. Now, I'm sure you can remember so much about that. He was so excited. <laughs> Those fireworks in Ottawa were just transformative. <laughs> we need a national imaginary that isn't embarrassing boilerplate uh, and a few uh, events here and there. We have to work on a national imaginary that lives in inconvenient and challenging as well as attractive and mobilizing ways. And in order to get there, we need many voices. And the university should be the lead institutions in this. They should not be risk averse. Risk is the university's business in, in all its different forms. And the risk the gambit, the gamble of indigenizing, of actually decolonizing education, uh, making knowledge as shamelessly dissident as it really ought to be, that is where we need to go. And there needs to be two rows, point tributaries, circles, powwows, and forms of reaction that are not like the reaction uh, to teepees in the park. Mm. We have got to get, we are better than that. Even though the China police force is better than that, uh, there's some of the political masters assuredly are not. We need to use the prestige and the power of the university to seriously transform society. And it cannot do that until it transforms itself in the name and in the aspects of indigenization. That's how it does. Here, here.